Welcome, everybody, to uh, the webinar today at RBH. This is uh, Dr. Eric Gustafson, and I look forward to, with, to uh, experiencing a, an eventful hour with you. Um, if you'll notice, there are handouts um, that you can take, you can download and make a copy of. Uh, one of the handouts is a copy of all of the slides that we have for you today. So let's begin. Um, have you ever thought about your relationship with stress? Uh, yes, we all have stress. And we all have an ongoing relationship with stress, from, from our daily hassles to significant adversities in our life. Uh, today, I want to challenge us to rethink our stress response um, and suggest that the stress response might be your friend and possibly uh, be helpful to you uh, rather than always something to, to flee from. So first of all, I want you to think about daily hassles, the demands, the deadlines, the disappointments, conflicts, and irritations that happen in life. We all have them. Uh, we can think of, of you know, things that have happened in the last 24 hours. Um, and uh, you know, social psychologists estimate that we have a good deal of these every day. Uh, so I actually think about these daily hassles. I, I like to think of them as stress opportunities. Opportunities to be stressed, opportunities to respond to stress, opportunities to either uh, you know, make the best of it or to be caught in the middle of, of a difficult time with stress. Um, so we actually have a, a poll, poll question. Think about your life and how many daily stress events do you think the average person has according to social psychologists? So. Go ahead and make a guess. All right. Go ahead and uh, get your votes in. A few more people still waiting for the vote. All right. So about 25% of people say that about 15 a day. 53% of people say 30 a day, 20% uh, say 60, and five of us, 5% say about uh, 100 per day. Well, you know, it may depend on our, our own personal lives, but social psychologists estimate that it is about 30 stress events per day. Some of us have, have a lot more opportunities, I like to think of them in terms of how we're going to respond to a situation in life. Um, you know, we're coming to understand more and more about the science of stress and the positive and negative effects on us biologically, uh, both short-term, long-term, relationally, and in our productivity. And what we find is that our stress, our daily stress responses uh, end up being habits. Um, and those habitual responses um, can be can be destructive uh, or they can be helpful. Um, the, the problem is is that breaking bad habits is often very difficult. But those habitual responses to stress end up affecting today's mood, uh, our short-term or long-term health. You can think about those kinds of consequences. Those of us that that have uh, tension that we experience in different parts of our body. Or, or stress-related diseases. Uh, absolutely, how we respond to stress today is going to affect uh, our relationships, whether personal or workplace, and how much we're going to get done today. So I want this to be an interactive uh, in terms of you thinking about uh, what we bring up today. Usually, I do this in a, in a personalized setting. So I'm actually going to give you some of the uh, questions for you to ponder uh, while we go through this. But think about 
your relationship with stress? Um, do you tend to avoid stress? Um, are you, you know, reluctant to face the day? Um, some of us deny that we have stress. Others still, uh, you know, create stress in our lives. Or um, some of us enjoy the rush of the drama that stress creates. You can think of some people that are that are like that. Um, and you know, working under stress, you know, is it making you more productive or less productive? Um, is it making you irritable or angry? Um, does stress, you know, shut down your emotions and uh, make it difficult to have your best thinking going? That, that's quite often our relationship with stress. Or some of us have a, a stress relationship where anxiety and worry build over the years and end up, uh, creating, you know, difficulties in life. Are you stressing about important things or small things? Is your stress response making you sick or does it energize you? So my question is, have you ever purposefully worked on your stress response? I think, uh, I think a lot of us try to work on our stress response on a regular basis. So think of something that you've recently faced and something that's stressful, in what ways have you responded to it? I'd encourage you to just take a few seconds and write down what comes to mind about how you responded to this recent stress. So keep, keep that in mind. So there's this famous man, Mark Twain, that I had some great sayings. I like this one because he, he looked at his life and he said that uh, I'm an old man now and uh, I have known a great many problems in my life, most of which never happened. Uh, this kind of cracks me up because this is the difference between uh, unnecessary stress uh, versus necessary stress. Uh, we often make much more of things than they really are. Our fear and uh, negative perceptions and expectations end up, uh, you know, getting our mind working and worrying and preparing us for the worst case scenarios that oftentimes don't occur. So we end up spending a lot of wasted time and energy with stress. So let's first of all define what stress is. When we talk about stress, um, you'll, you'll see things you know, in research and I want us to be kind of warned about, you know, you get stress research results, and, and sometimes they're talking about stressors, which is anything that knocks us out of balance. So this can be, you know, any of the things that bother us, you know, externally or internally, anything that pressures us, scares us, worries us, these are called stressors. So it can be those circumstances, or it can be our own expect, perspective, expectation, and attitude. But sometimes the other side of stress that gets reported is really the stress response. And this is what our body and mind does to try to reestablish balance. You know, how we react to the stressors is called our stress response. It's basically, you know, what do we do? What, what is our physical and mental response? to the situations. And so we like to think about the stressor as that external or even internal pressure and the stress response as our physical or mind um, res mental responses to stress. And the other thing to think about is stress levels can go from, you know, irritations to, you know, large, uh, losses and tragedies in our in our life. Um, today what we're talking about are the daily to mid-level stressors and not necessarily the life altering uh, tragedies. It will save that for another another training. Um, but I want you to think about stress in, in these different terms. Um, Let's think about uh, how stress is defined. Well, the stress 
first came about by, I like to think of him as the grandfather of stress, Dr. Hans Selye. And he said that it's the body's reaction to demands that are placed upon it. He was focusing a lot on the physical responses to stress, hormone uh, changes, uh, physical conditions such as, he first came up with ulcers as being a response to stress, and then he researched for many years a number of other responses that, that stress uh, had on, on physical, uh, physical responses to in, in demands on the body. So the thing is, he ended up late in his life because he said, I didn't understand what the English word stress really was. I should have used the word strain because as you think about it, think about what we just said about the stress response. He was talking about not the stressors, but the stress response. And the stress response is really the forces that are that are placed upon the body. I, I'm sorry. Yes, if if we were to say stressors, stressors are the forces. So that would be called strain. And so um, you think about it. What's the force? How how much can I handle? Like like the the weight of a bridge and and uh, the, my ability to handle stress is really, you know, how much am I strained? How much am I able to handle? We're not going to go around and say, I'm under strain. We're still going to use the word stress. But just to identify it further, that it's really about how much can we handle. So when we think about resilience and stress, we think about how much we're able to build strength in order to respond to stress. One other definition I like is that stress is when the demands you experience exceed our abilities or our perceived abilities to meet the demands. So this is important because the perception of our ability to meet demands is really important. Um, we need skills and abilities to handle stress. So developing resilient skills is a way of getting better at handling stress. You think about some people are able to handle much more than others. Uh, and on the other hand, our perception of our ability, of ourselves, and our, our, our capacity to manage the demands of stress is really cr critical because our perception matters a lot. And we're going to discuss the uh, research regarding perception of stress and how much that can actually influence the physical responses. Now, here's a list of what we know of the chronic stress effects on the, the bodily systems. And there are an incredible amount of, there's an incredible amount of data on the diagnoses and the uh, the conditions that that are resulting from from chronic stress. So we know that stress can be can be bad for us. So here's my question. Next question for you is, what percentage of doctor visits have a stress component? So uh, let's do this poll. What do you think? Okay, wait for a few more votes. Okay. So 5% said under 20% of doctor visits are related to, have to stress. 24% said 20 to 40, 43% said 40 to 60, and 29% 60 to 80. The actual answer is uh, 60 to 80 percent. Pretty amazing. Huh? When you think about it, it's in terms of uh, it, it may not be a direct stress component, but but the conditions are exacerbated uh, by stress. So we really understand that you know stress is in a sense very toxic. Uh, it can be toxic to our system. Uh, there's been so, uh, there was a great book written by Dr. Sapolsky out of Stanford called "Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers." Funny name, 
but a great resource if you really want to get into the science of stress, the, uh, the, the stress hormones of cortisol and others that affect us during stress. He studied a, a variety of animals in the, in the savannas of, of Africa, baboons and zebras and so forth, that taking cortisol levels and, and, and recognizing that, you know, the cortisol levels go high in, in fight-flight responses, and yet zebras and other animals that are responding to stress have a way of uh, reducing and recovering from that stress, and so those stress chemicals don't affect them. Whereas other more socialized groups like baboons uh, that are constantly fighting amongst themselves and, and live in a very hierarchical system can have a great amount of, of stress and stress chemicals, cortisol, and those, those kinds of systems uh, end up you know, showing that stress can have a negative effect on, on physical health. Um, so we're at our third polling question. So this is an important one. What is your usual stress mindset? So think about this. Stress is harmful. That, so it's either stress is harmful or stress is enhancing. What do you usually think? That the effects are negative and should be avoided, like it depletes health and vitality, depletes performance and productivity, and it inhibits learning and growth, or it is stress enhancing? that the effects are positive, that it improves health, it can enhance performance and productivity and facilitate learning and growth. What is, what is our usual mindset? So go ahead and vote upon that. What do you think? Okay. A few more votes we're looking for. Well, I'm going to say that our voting is pretty much in line with the national average. Some of us are voting for both of them because, in a sense, both are true. But 88% um, of us are saying that stress, we think about stress as, as usually harmful, and 24% that, that stress is usually enhancing. Uh, and in fact, uh, 85% of Americans uh, in, in studies agree that stress is harmful, whereas about 15% would normally say that stress is enhancing. Um, I want to give you a study that comes out of uh, McGonigal's book that I'm going to make a reference to, The Upside of Stress. And she, she starts out with this study, and she also references it on her uh, TED Talk. You may want to look that up. Um, that there was a study of 30,000 adults, and basically the question was put to them, do you believe stressful is harmful to your health? And these 30,000 adults basically kind of kept track of, of their belief about their stress and whether their stress was harmful to their health. And after eight years... Those with the, the, um, that believed that their stress levels were harmful and had high levels of stress, they were 43% uh, higher risk of mortality, higher risk of dying, because number one, they had high stress levels and that they believed that their stress was harmful to the health. Now, there was another group that was, had the lowest risk of death. Who might that be? The lowest risk of death amongst these 30,000 adults was not those who had low stress. The lowest risk of death was those who had moderate to high stress, but believed and perceived that their stress was not harmful to their health. Interesting, huh? Um, it comes to show that our perception and our belief and our, you know, somehow the connection to is this stress you know, harming me? Is it, is it toxic in my life? Is it leading to physical consequences? Ends up causing people to have uh, uh, a higher mortality rate. Believing somehow that stress is, is not harmful ends up uh, almost inoculating people from the effects of 
of long-term stress. Let's talk about daily hassles, those irritants that we mentioned up front. Um, a large study about daily hassles was done with the, the VA group, and this happened over many, many years. They studied all kinds of, of medical and psychological data with this, with this group. And uh, what they came up with is that men reporting being stressed or bothered by daily hassles were three times more likely to have died than those who reported not being bothered by daily hassles. The difference in this is their attitude toward their stress, toward their daily hassles whether the daily hassles they were bothered by or those daily hassles they let go. So basically they were answering a, a uh, inventory that basically said, how much do these things in your life, in your daily hassles bother you? Do they not bother you much or do they, are they upsetting you? How upsetting or not upsetting are they? And so it goes through about 53 different potential things in your life, everything from, from you know, finances to, you know, perception of politics to driving, you know, transportation, all of these things that we encounter in our daily lives. And the distinction between those who, who you know, died more often um, were those that were not you know, either you're bothered by your stress or you're not bothered by your daily hassles. This is really eye-opening and has a lot of implication for us in terms of how, <clears throat> how we manage and how we respond to our daily hassles, our, our daily 30, shall we call them, our opportunities for stress. Now, how are you handling your opportunities for stress? Are we letting, it's like, don't sweat the small stuff. Um, that that book and that and that uh, motto, uh, you know, can have a tremendous amount of effect on our our stress uh, disease potential. Another uh, important study about daily hassles was about workplace burnout, job satisfaction, and poor performance predictors. It basically said. There are two things that will predict burnout and job satisfaction and performance issues. Number one is repetitive worry. And the most important one is negativity. So they, rule, they, they controlled for things like, you know, how demanding the job is, the problems in the workplace, the, the relationship with the, the boss or supervisor. And, and were able to sort those things out and came, it came down to predictions for burnout are worry and negativity. So how we perceive what is going on and the engaging of a, of a perception and a, a response that, that is, is really a stressful response and a negative perception response is really what's going to uh, more predict, you know, difficulties in jaw on the job, and and uh, and poor performance. So I kind of like to make a, a recommendation for people that yes, complaining is you know we all complain, and yet if we can limit our complaining to five minutes a day, and then you know be able to have a mindset switch about our job, uh, it's going to put us in a much better place. So limit those complaining times. So a little bit about the fight flight response. We actually have now added freeze. So what is dangerous is if we engage in this fight flight nervous system response on a daily basis and 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 you know set off the chemicals that the, the stress chemicals that so affect our health that puts us in danger. So to, to describe it a little bit, it's really the, our sympathetic uh, nervous system. It's the on switch. So we can all think of a time when the on switch occurred in a fight flight response, some kind of 
danger or fear, a uh, life-threatening situation. Uh, to me, I think of uh, the last time the, the you know, uh, the, the lights came on behind me as I was driving, the police was driving behind me. I get this automatic uh, response. I think we could all uh, relate to that. So what happens in that is that there are activating hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol, which have these response. They increase heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. It, it does the things that gets us ready to respond to a threat. Um, the, the, the reactions are almost automatic. Um, and it, what happens in that, in that fight flight response is unneeded functions, bodily functions stop. Uh, you know, things like immune system, uh, stops because that's not important. Um, and, and in fact, if we are constantly too frequently in this fight flight response, we end up impairing our immune system's ability to manage uh, uh, illness and bacteria and things like that. The other thing that happens is, is an area of the brain called the amygdala is like an alarm system. It's an emotional alarm system that goes off. And what happens is it bypasses our prefrontal cortex or our problem solving area in our mind. So in the fight flight response, we are uh, responding almost automatically. We're responding out of that, that reflexive habit of how, you know, you know, what are we going to do? We, we see it as a threat. We see it as a, as a fear. And we're going to take action. And we're going to have emotions like fear and anger as a part of that. Now, we all need to work on our off switch, our recovery switch. And that recovery switch um, gives us re specific recovery hormones that are listed here that help us in, in specific ways. Norm immediately, it normalizes our bodily functions. Um, it, it helps us focus more on goals, like it's not, it's not just the immediate threat, but helps us look more broadly at, you know, there's a problem here. Stress is usually, as I like to think of it, as a problem. And stress management is problem solving. And we're not in a problem solving mode when we're in fight flight. We're in uh, only when we can recover from that can we can we engage uh, the you know, problem solving or prefrontal cortex thinking. Uh, the amygdala gets shut down, which means or lessens the 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 fear and the anger response lessens. Our immune system kicks in, and then something called neuroplasticity, where where the nerves are are regenerating themselves or uh, neuro. Um, um, pathways get remapped. Uh, neuroregeneration is another thing that happens in recovery. Basically, we're, we're come to find out that, that stress provides a learning opportunity. And if we, if we recover from it, you'll notice and you think about the, the, the few hours after, so let's say, a conflict with a, a coworker or a, or a loved one, you end up thinking about over and over again, you know, what did I say, or how could I have done that differently, or what did they mean? And that is the effect of the, the, the uh, stress response, the recovery response, trying to remap or relearn uh, how, to, how to manage stress, how to manage that stress so that when we face it again, we can remap our habit. We can re, uh, redo and not stay in the same old habit. If we just avoid, this is where avoidance becomes problematic because avoidance just keeps us away from rethinking our responses and relearning new ways of doing things. So Dr. Selye talked about all of this bad stress, but he also said there's good stress. So let's talk about good stress. And in fact, he called it eustress. So it's either distress or eustress, good stress, um, which can be the what's called the excite and delight response to stress. So think about times, say, you're on a roller coaster or some other exciting thing that you like to do. The same fight-flight stress response can happen to us, but what what is the difference about if you're in a fight-flight situation 
but you don't have the same kind of fear that gets you disabled, you know, or anger, or emotions that, that get in the way. It's really because it's your, your, your perception of it is, I'm choosing to do this. I, I want this. This is, so our perception says, this is under my control somehow. And that, that kicks in those feel good chemicals as opposed to a fear chemical, goes from fear to enjoyment, excitement, thrill, that kind of thing. So when we think about it, Dr. Selye ended up saying, it's not what happens to us that matters so much, but what we do with it, how we perceive it, what we say to ourselves, how we respond. We basically have two options when it comes to stress. We can avoid stress, which actually causes a uh, you know, stress generation cycle. Uh, avoidance is distraction and not problem solving. We can think of destructive ways that, of avoidance habits, you know, that we engage in anything from, uh, you know, I want to go play video games or, or avoid this person or, you know, drink or some other avoidance behavior that, that really keeps us stuck in a process of not problem solving and what happens is that, that stress comes back and there we're in the same kind of lack of being able to respond to it. The other response is to actually take on that stress, learn from it. And even researchers are finding to use it as fuel to actually thrive during hard times. So people who bounce back basically are ones that have resilience skills, the ability not to avoid stress, but to engage it, to recognize what's going on, that I'm in the middle of stress, to welcome it as something, almost as a signal that's telling me I need to deal with something, and to use it then to be better. Think about how do I avoid stress. We all face adversity. None of us are immune. The question is, how do we get from one side of it to the other? And what we'd like to suggest is a mind, our mindset, our perspective is really the most critical factor to coming out as resilient and strong and being able to make it through hard times. Long uh, time ago back in, I think, the early 80s, there was a seminal work by Dr. Scott Peck called The Road Less Traveled. Now, I'd recommend it to you, but you actually only need to go to the first page. Because if you really believe the first page and the first actual line of the book and incorporate that into our life, then this is going to help with our stress response and being resilient. First line in the book is, life is difficult. He goes on to say, once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. So think about that. What, are, what is your expectation of life? If you're like me, our assumptions about life often are that life should be what? Fun? Life should be easy? comfortable, what, write down what you assume sometimes that life should be. I, sometimes I think life should be fair, and that's why I, I am angry and responding to this stressful situation, or that life should always stay the same, and yet it doesn't. So if we are able to take our perspective and on a daily basis recognize with the assumption that Today's going to have its difficulties. It's going to have its joys and, it, and it's going to have its sorrows. But if I can start with the assumption that life is not easy, life is not just fun, life is not just comfortable, life is not just stable, but I need to look at life differently, then I can become a more resilient person and manage stress. 
What is human resilience? It is our ability to absorb high levels of disruptive adversity, change and uncertainty, bounce back, and even excel in our functioning without acting in what kind of ways? Dysfunctional ways. So it's being able to deal with adversity change, bounce back, and ex even excel in how we manage. One of the attachments is a resilience quiz. Uh, the resilience quiz, feel free to download it, take it, uh, have somebody else take it on you. And, and I would like to suggest that look at those items and choose one to work on. Uh, we have a, a resilience coaching program at RBH where we have people commit for up to six months to practice 10 minutes a day on different resilience skills that we teach and walk them through. And we find that people's stress response really improves. I mentioned stress inoculation. Uh, this little guy says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. He takes life's uh, lemons and makes lemonade out of it. Um, there was some early research I want to expose you to that um, it was Dr. Matty back in the, in the 80s. He ended up coming up with the word hardiness, which is a type of resilience, and that's basically the courage to grow from stress. You and I have the courage to grow from our stress. It was, he was in an interesting position. He was a psychologist that had been working with Bell Telephone. And in 1981, they laid off half of their 13,000 employees. So he had a lot of data, a lot of medical and psychological data on a number of these employees. So he was able to study you know, those that were left, those so that he noticed that there were great differences. Some of those that were left got stuck under the pile of stress and because they were under all kinds of demands, changes, uncertainty, their, their job roles had changed, they were doing twice or three times as much as they had done before. And, and so he saw a number of them that were developing health problems and depression, anxiety and so forth. But then he saw this other group of employees that seemed to be managing well, thriving and not having physical responses to stress. So he wanted to study the difference. And he went back through all of his data, did follow-up evaluations. And basically, the di this distinction between those who managed stress well was those that ended up seeing their difficult circumstances as a normal part of life. What else do you think they were like? Think about it. They saw stress as an opportunity to grow. Um, they had developed in themselves, they were people that had developed uh, strength and reserves to, to manage things in life. There were also those who had been through stressful situations, you know, moderate to high levels of stress in their life, and they ended up using that uh, stress to stay engaged, or their experience with prior stress, to stay engaged with difficulties rather than give up. Uh, they believed that they could continue to make choice and that, and that viewing their struggle uh, each day was not to leading them to the worst case scenarios, but to uh, a balanced perspective through the midst of their suffering. So this stress inoculation research where, you know, the stress that we've gone through helps us, you know, if we, if we manage it well, it helps us in the future. And, you know, I want to be one of those people that when stress comes along, I don't start succumbing to the negative effects of stress. Dr. McGonigal has a great definition of stress. It is stress is something what arises when something we care about is at stake. Think about that. What is it that you cared about? The last thing that stressful event that you had, what did I care about? We're responding to those things that we care about. She ended up suggesting that stress can be helpful, that it can boost our performance. Here's a copy of the book that I recommend. Some of the, some of the research she, she cites is that 
under social stress tests that if you are uh, primed and educated on the fact that stress can be enhancing, that it actually improves performance on things like uh, uh, graduate record exams, uh, admission exams, uh, school, uh, being able to perform under pressure. Even people with social anxiety disorder, if they're given the, the education that stress is enhancing, that every time my stress starts to come up in the middle of a situation, I can use that for my good, their performance improves. Another set of studies is about job burnout. And like I mentioned before, this was about teachers and doctors, that attitude towards stress on the job is what protects from a stress uh, poor performance. So the alternative to stress being toxic is that it can also be fuel. It can be motivation, energy to improve performance, to learn from our difficulties, keep us connected to others, obviously avoid danger, protect ourselves, focus on goals, even live a meaningful life and enjoy the ride. Uh, fourth polling question is identify the mindset change that research does not support as using or recommend using as an alternative to the fight flight stress response. So I'm just kind of giving you what do you think? Is it is it rise to the challenge, connect? The stress can help us connect or protect to try to reduce or remove the stress, or that stress is an opportunity to learn and grow. So what does the research not support as a good alternative to the fight flight response? So what are we getting? Go ahead and answer that. Okay, so most of you are saying that it's reduce or, the, or remove the stress, 65%. So that actually is correct. It's, it, it, it's counter to our usual stress management training to go ahead and reduce your stress or to remove the stress. What, what the stress research, research is suggesting is that we actually need to face our stress in order to do these things, rise to the challenge, either connect or protect our loved ones or to learn and grow ourselves. So let's quickly get to these alternatives. Remember, fight flight is a threat response. The alternative is that we can use that stress signal to either rise to the challenge, to connect or protect someone that we love, or you know, to stress is actually an opportunity to to socially connect or to or to uh, resolve conflicts with others, or to learn and grow from. We need to actually shift our mindset from the fight fight response, which is basically these things. It's, a, it's important for life-threatening events, and it does sensitize us to future threats. But if we're able to move that into a challenge response, which takes it more as an opportunity to grow, we, we add in, you know, this is interesting, you know, or this is an adventure, or this is going to get me to a goal of mine. Um, it brings in these balancing hormones that can actually provide health to us and that this arousal, this physical arousal is purposeful and it focuses us on the fact that we can do things. So the rise to the challenge is an important one and this is one that I would recommend that you focus on next time you feel stress is, am I willing to use this energy of stress to you know, motivate me to focus my attention um, can I can I look at this in some positive way, like this is an adventure or a, or a, a trial I'm willing to get over, and even feel like I'm excited about this or I can do this? Um, you know, think of of sporting events or that kind of thing. When when people are anxious before the event or before a performance, say a musical performance, I'm amped or excited is a lot different than I just need to calm down and using the stress to actually help your performance. Uh, in terms of connecting, you know, there are lots of studies about what, what connecting does. One was about a stress ball 
with a, your, a loved one going through a, a, a difficult, painful procedure, you get to hold a stress ball or you hold their hand. And the difference is holding the stress ball, the, the amygdala uh, it still gets activated and you get stuck in the threat response. And there, there is versus when you hold somebody's hand, you're connecting and you're engaging things like this dopamine, I'm sorry, the dopamine and the oxytocin. Oxytocin is what we call the love hormone. The dopamine is the feel-good hormone. And those help us in the recovery process of stress and end up doing things like oxytocin is actually good for our heart and protects our heart from, uh, from, from, from heart damage. Yeah. So there's some great studies on that. What about learning and growing from stress? Well, we started to mention this before, that going through stress can make us better at it. The brain is wanting to learn from stress and grow from stress, and that we can almost like re-imprint new, uh, new ways of responding to stress, like I'm going to reach out to somebody, you know, that connecting response, or I'm going to, uh, to learn from this and, and, and see it as a goal. So learning from, from stress ends up inoculating us when future stress happens, make us stronger when we're able, when we face those similar stresses. There are actually neurosteroids that get activated when we uh, are recovering from stress. It does everything like, and we can also activate these neuro, same neurosteroids, which I like to think of as fertilizer for the brain. When we work out, when we sleep, and when we go through calming exercises, calming down from stress, it, it actually helps us develop new neural pathways, improves our performance and productivity, improves our health, health outcomes, and recover from the negative effects of the stress hormones. So it's really there for a learning and growing opportunity. Getting near the end here, what I want to talk about before we get to Q&A is that Stress is a paradox that in order to um, stress is strongly associated with both debilitating illness, depression, those kinds of things, as well as stress is associated with a healthy and meaningful life. Think about, you know, a meaningful life. Is it stressful or not? Meaning in our lives usually is pushing us to do something important. Think of uh, uh, parenting young children, incredibly stressful, but also incredibly meaningful. And that there's a large body of, of research that uh, shows that daily perspective on looking at our values and our purpose in life helps us to relook at the daily stress in new and different ways. I've added a, a values exercise as one of the handouts. Uh, this, extra, this type of exercise is, is probably the most helpful thing people can do on a daily basis. Uh, if you even do it for several weeks, look at your, your, a value that you hold. Say, I'm, I value integrity or honesty or, or um, you know, love. And you relook at your daily experience in that light of your values. When we put people through um, our, our resilience training, we actually help them relook at their stress language. Um, things like, and we all have stress language that we go through. When we're going through pain, there was a research about putting people's hands in, in ice cold bucket and those that were able to handle the, the strain versus of that and the difficulty versus those that weren't had to do with their thinking, either a negative thinking process or this you know, resilient, forward-looking thinking. Think about the kinds of statements, we all talk to ourselves, think about the kind of statements that we go through when our mind is stress. You know, is, is, is it, you know, I'm just, this is too much for me, I'm stressed out, uh, I'm such a blank. Uh, if you're like me, you know, I, I tend to do this, and yet those are the very kinds of things that put our mindset in a way that uh, 
set us up for failure in terms of a stress response. The results of our resilience training, uh, in, in particular on, for stress uh, scores. So the people that in the top group there that started out with an average score of about 182 ended up with a low average score after our training. And then those that were in the high stress group, that's the number where average 233, ended up in an average level. So all to say that resilience and stress training practice works. I can't help but leave you in terms of a stress uh, training without saying the, the most important stress tool that we found in the research. <clears throat> and that actually is helping others. Helping others or altruism ends up vaccinating us from stress-related disease, reduces mortality <clears throat> and illness, and frankly, if we want to feel good tomorrow, the best thing we can do is to volunteer to help somebody today or give, give of our time. And in fact, if we're under time pressure, helping somebody for a few minutes is actually more helpful to get our deadline, meet our deadline than given, being given more time. <clears throat> so you have the capacity, we all do, to change the channel of our current mindset. We have the capacity to choose to face today's problems as, as challenges and to use stress as fuel, <clears throat> fuel to act. There's a three-step process to get to a stress as enhancing. These are the three steps. Number one, we have to be aware of our stress. Acknowledge that it's going on and instead of just avoiding it. The second would be welcoming that stress, saying, you know, this stress is here for a reason. There's, it's actually a signal to me that there's a problem in my life that I need to overcome or a challenge that I want to face, as opposed to, again, avoiding it. And then using the stress to help you get through whatever it is that you're facing. So in conclusion, before we look at questions, if you have questions, go ahead and write them out. <clears throat> stress if it doesn't kill me. So we've talked about stress is harmful. Yes, it is, except when it's not. For example, stress is debilitating, except when we use it as fuel and energy and motivation to resolve problems. Performance stress can impair our performance, except when we become excited and use the energy to reach our goal. Stress increases our risk of health problems, except when we use it to reach out rise to the occasion, or solve problems. It can lead to hopelessness, except when we live by our values. Our daily hassles can lead to all kinds of problems, except if we accept hassles as a part of our life. Adversity leads to illness and depression, except when we help others and choose to learn from suffering. Anxiety can lead to panic, except when we believe we're up for the challenge. I just want to challenge you to how you're going to handle your own daily 30. Make a personal action plan. Maybe it's time to rethink stress. Okay, let's see if we have any questions in the last few minutes here. Okay, the attachments are, should be on the handouts there. That's a, there's a question about the attachments. Um, So what, somebody has a question about explaining some techniques when you feel negative stress taking over and feel overwhelmed. How do you course correct the feeling at the moment? Great question. Because being in that moment um, really is about, you know, you, there are all kinds of calming techniques that you can learn, but it's really about perspective and accepting the stress and, and, and looking at what is this stress telling me? What is important to me that's at stake, like Dr. McGonigal said. 
what kind of signal is this stress telling me so that I can get to my problem solving mentality as opposed to my fear and anger response. Uh, the skills coaching available to us, so ask about that um, with your HR department to contact RBH for the coaching program. And it is a telephonic program, somebody asked about that. Um, the handouts panel. If people are not seeing the handouts panel, Brenda, I've got Brenda on the line. Can you help us out with that, Brenda? Oh, yeah. The handouts panel is towards the bottom of the GoToWebinar interface. It's just below the questions panel and just above chat. Um, and if you can't find them there, I'm happy to email them out to you following the webinar. Great. Any other questions? Okay, somebody says uh, a stress response can involve emotions. How do you lower your emotions when handling stress? Uh, that takes training. It takes resilience and practice. Like any other skill, we need to take daily practice to be able to, you know, relook at our stress response. Um, and those emotions, again, are signals. Those emotions are uh, sometimes are, are very limiting emotions and so they're all related to our perspective and how we're seeing how we're thinking about the problem at hand so just even sitting down and writing out what's another way to look at this going to somebody else and what's another way i can look at this um, and and w holding back those emotions from from just being uh you know uh, so quick to respond um, any others? We're just about out of time here. Uh, cultural stress that is generalized, like the shooting that occurred today involving Congress people. Yeah, we're in the middle of all kinds of uh, cross-cultural issues and people taking and perceiving things, you know, in, in extreme ways. And, and really, we all need to be, you know, sort of more balanced in our thinking. Uh, and so when we're on the extreme of thinking, we, we've kind of lost control of perspective. It keeps coming back to taking charge of my own thinking, my own perspective, and, uh, and sharing that with others that you know. Uh, and that, you know, the only thing we can do is control what we have in our lives, and that's us and our relationships. Okay, it's common to be able to use stress as a catalyst at work, but tend to avoid it ignored with personal life. Uh, are the same skills used? Absolutely. Yeah, we sort of can get trained to use, you know, workplace stress as, as something to help us, but it's the same in personal life, and it takes just the same practice skills to be used. So this was a, was a great time and a great uh, discussion, good, good questions. If you have any more, I'd be happy to answer them by email. Uh, you could leave those on the questions. So just to leave you with perspective, uh, you know, we all have options in terms of response to stress, and I'm just like to think of this guy. This guy is focused on his purpose and values and this other one is overwhelmed with their stress. I want to give you some recommendations for further reading. There's copies of this on your handouts, but highly recommend The Upside of Stress uh, and the book on the right, Stop Stress This Minute. Some great tools in that one that are easy to go through. We use that in our resilience training as part of the assignments. So all, all of these are good reading options. And just a reminder that RBH is available for, you know, online and personal phone and, and we have counselors in the area that can help in terms of building resilience and managing stress. I want to thank you all for participating and, uh, and for learning with us today about, about rethinking resilience and rethinking stress. Thank you so much.